Hello everybody, I'm Ian Somerville and today I'm going to be talking to you about my explorations with a phone camera which I got last autumn. I've got an iPhone but my talk is not really about iPhones. I think what I'm going to say is relevant to all phone cameras which you get on modern relatively high-end smartphones. They've all really got pretty good phones like Samsung and the Google, the Google Pixel and things like that. So let me start with my misconceptions. Like a lot of people who are interested in photography, I thought that phone cameras were of limited use. They couldn't produce very good pictures. They were fine for taking family photographs, baby, baby photographs, or as my daughters like, photographs of your dinner. They like us to send us photographs if we have anything interesting to eat. Or something which is really particularly useful, if you're out walking somewhere and you see a, an information sign with a map, I can never remember where the paths go and things like that. So I take a photograph of the map and I can check that as I'm walking, in this case around Loch Kinnord uh, near Dinnet. And of course, the selfies. <coughs> the advent of the phone promoted the selfie and now they're a really big thing. I have taken two selfies in my life. This was the last one I took in uh, May 2015, which I took to show that sometimes it does snow in May. And you'll be very pleased to know you'll be seeing no more selfies in the rest of this talk. Let me talk about the iPhone camera. Um, I think the nature of phones as such is they, they're all kind of around this sort of specification. Um, it, it's got a, a 12 megapixel third of an inch sensor. So it's a small sensor but with a lot of pixel, mega, uh, pixels packed onto it. It has a very good optical image stabilization system. Um, and a wide angle lens equivalent to 28mm and a fixed aperture lens. So the aperture is not variable and <clears throat> I think they do that because it makes the design of the camera simpler rather than any technical reasons why it has to be like that. I got my camera on the 25th of October last year. I decided after some deliberation that I'd like a new camera phone. I'd read about the iPhone and I ordered one and it was delivered on that date. And I went out for a walk in a local wood, which is six or seven minutes from where I live. And I think this was about the third photograph I took. When I got home, I looked at the, the pictures I'd taken that day and I thought, this is not a toy camera. I really am impressed by the quality that I seem to be getting from this. So I went out again the next day. We were in a lovely spell of autumn weather. I went out to Loch Kinnord, past Dinnet, where I often go and have a walk, <coughs> and took some pictures of the birches. I took, took lots of pictures, and I took my SLR with me as well, because I had some ideas that I would there were some things the phone camera would not be good for. I took pictures of the birches and general picture of the loch in the autumn sunshine. I didn't use my SLR at all. And I stopped off at, at Potarch on the way back. I, I wanted for a long time to take a picture of the D in the autumn sunshine for a, a kind of wee project I'm doing about taking the river D from the source and the Cairngorms to the sea. Uh, I wanted the autumn colours here and I took this photograph of the D. So, why use a phone camera? You may say, okay, phone cameras are fine, but I have a perfectly good camera. Why would I want to use a phone camera that probably isn't as good? I'll just use the camera I've got. Well, I think there are three good reasons for doing that, but they all come from this characteristic. iPhone, camera, phone, internet browser, GPS, everything else weighs 142 grams. 
You can see it beside an SLR and I weighed the SLR with a wide angle lens which is to give me the equivalent and it was approximately one and a quarter kilograms. So we're looking at eight or nine times heavier. It's not dramatically heavy, but when you've been carrying this around your neck for a couple of hours, you really notice it. So the, the difference in weight and portability, I think makes a huge difference. And here's an example last autumn, but later on after the beautiful weather, we went out to the Northwest Highlands and had a walk on a, a hill called Coolmore. The weather was not great, shall we say. Low cloud, mist, intermittent drizzle. I looked at it and thought, it's not really worth taking a camera. But I had my phone with me. So we went up the hill and as it happened, close to the summit, the clouds suddenly lifted and we had a view like this over to Sylvan. The cleaners lasted about five minutes, they rolled in again and that was the end of it. And I think this captures the autumn landscape in that area in some ways better than the uh, attractive pictures of the rising sun that you so often see. It's actually much more like this. The other great thing about your phone camera is that you've got it with you. You've got it with you all the time. So, Thursday evening I was coming along to a meeting. I was a few minutes early so I, I took a walk and I, I went up past the flats and I, and I took this photograph which I think is, is quite a dramatic picture of the flats. And then this one of the college. Well, I was very pleased with both of them. We have a, <coughs> our monthly subject challenge was looking up and they both fitted well into that. Those of you who were here last week uh, saw my picture of the horse and the greens. And <coughs> I was down taking the, these pictures at the head of Loch Voyle. I took them with my SLR. I packed up the camera, put it in the bag and was walking back to my car and I saw these guys coming up to a shed which I didn't pay much attention to. Uh, I looked again and they were dragging a boat, a canoe, to launch just on the loch. It, within two seconds I had my iPhone out and I took this photograph. Everything actually taken on automatic. I was very pleased. I think, I think it's turned out quite well. There is no way in which I could have taken this by putting down my camera, putting down the, <coughs> taking out the camera bag, taking my camera out the bag and so on and so forth. So it's this fast access, this ability to be taking a photograph within literally one or two seconds of when you see it that is actually a fantastic advantage of, the, of, of, of phone cameras. So being a, an engineer, I'm not willing to just say, well, it is a good camera. I wanted to actually compare it, to compare it with my SLR. So I, I took a number of shots to try and compare it and to, to look at the different characteristics and, and how these compared. I started at Potarch, where I showed the picture of the D, and I took this picture with my iPhone, with the rocks in the foreground, and the sunlit background. Now it's actually quite a, a difficult picture to take because the rocks were in quite deep shadow so I exposed for the background and then I lightened the rocks in the, in the editor. I took this with one camera with my iPhone and this one with my SLR. Not exactly the same field of view, I wasn't being very scientific in this picture. It's handheld, I didn't try and keep the same aperture or anything, but uh, I just wanted to get a general impression of how they would compare. And both seem to me completely acceptable at this kind of definition, at this kind of uh, projection, they both seem more than adequate. So I took the picture and I cropped it to the rocks, rocks in the foreground here. And these are the rocks with the, on the SLR. And these were the rocks in the iPhone. Now, there is a difference. The SLR has got a bit of noise in it because they were 
in quite deep shadow and because I they were actually underexposed that noise has shown up whereas I think the iPhone has got a, a noise correction algorithm in it and it has actually if it has picked up the noise it has tried to eliminate that so what I did was then I tried to do some noise elimination in Lightroom and came up with this one now the, I, the there is no doubt that the SLR is better it's better resolution and I think it's resolving the colors the color distinctions better I tried a test that is a wee bit more scientific I don't have any kind of specialist charts or anything so I took a picture of my bookcase with the iPhone and <clears throat> with the Canon and these basically have got no manipulation and you can see the dif you can see differences in terms of definition they're about the same the colors are a wee bit different so the the Canon is slightly less saturated I think that's the in-camera processing that's that's making I, I don't know it's the sensor or the in-camera processing but again the difference is not huge I tried blowing this up and up and up using the on in Lightroom and at high magnifications you can see a difference there is no doubt that the Canon is better but it's not a lot better so in terms of definition and sharpness I think the iPhone lens sensor combination is really very good it's not something that is in any way soft the way it used to be in old phone cameras you can see it's very sharp and it focuses very close and it actually at close range it has quite a good depth of field I tried and failed to replicate this shot <coughs> simply because if I go that close with a, a different kind of lens I don't get the same depth of field and my my wide angle lens and my Canon doesn't go that close this photo also shows the problem the dynamic range that can be captured by the phone is not, not nearly as good as it with a larger sensor so the highlights tend to get blown out very quickly because of the black background here the exposure I think was possibly a little bit more than it should have been but if you'd done that on a Canon or a Nikon I think you would have been able to pull detail out of the head of the dandelion and that detail just isn't there in terms of sharpness I think the lens is excellent dynamic range not so good I think that's its, its most significant weakness and the other thing that small sensors have a reputation for is noise so I took this photograph of the kirk at Queen's Cross I took it on a, a, both the iPhone and the Canon ones were taken on a tripod iPhone and Canon at this level you can see the different you can see differences in the color rendering but they both look pretty sharp the noise doesn't look too bad in either of them if you crop the image right in you can see here there is significantly more noise on the iPhone photograph that's just what you would expect however you've got to remember that if we go back to here it doesn't look too bad and there is no noise elimination no noise reduction uh, manipulations being assigned to that the wide angle lens has got a large depth of field but because you don't have any control over the aperture if you want to have front to back sharpness with a close focus you don't get it this is Krathis Castle and I would ideally have liked the daffodils and the castle to be in focus and you can see from focus here on the daffodils and goes through to the castle maybe if I had manually done some stuff somewhere in here I would have been better but I still don't think I would have had the definition the sharpness in the castle that I really would have wanted not exactly the same shot because my Canon wide angle lens doesn't go as close but you can see here I've got sharpness from the front to the back by using a wide angle lens with a smaller aperture 
most of my, both of my daughters live in Edinburgh and uh, I spend a lot of time when I'm there kind of getting out the house and walking around and it was a delight not to take a camera on my shoulder but simply to have my phone in my pocket it lets you, gives you the opportunity to capture things you wouldn't necessarily always capture. So this graffiti wall, Edinburgh usually has very uninteresting and boring graffiti. In fact, this is the only place I know, which is some garages near the meadows. And luckily someone with a red jacket actually came walking along at the same when I was taking that photograph. These, they have not been photoshopped into this picture. Another seat. Although probably I might well, well have had the, cat, the camera there. We had a little bit of a temperature inversion over the city. <coughs> Pentland sticking out above it and Duddingston Golf Course. This is an example here of where by exposing for the highlights, I've largely avoided the kind of washing out of the highlights and then bringing up the shadows in Lightroom. Greyfriars Churchyard. And the Scottish Parliament, a building I really like. I think there's lots of interesting architectural features there. And I like on the Scottish, Par Scottish Parliament building little snippets of poems, adding some <coughs> Scottish culture to passers-by. And then you can cross the road and get possibly the tackiest and worst Scottish souvenir I think I've ever seen, <clears throat> an apron with cleavage. I tried it with some indoor shots, um, I had no idea how it would perform, this is in the portrait gallery and I think it's actually, the camera has actually done quite well, this was taken uh, on automatic, it was, <clears throat> it was before I had any other apps and in a pub called the Guild for Arm, Guild for Ar blah, 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 Guildford Arms uh, where you can look down on the people. And in a restaurant called the Dome, which is a, an old bank building, very impressive dome and very elaborate flower arrangements. In general, I think the camera does really well on this kind of reasonably well lit indoor shot. I think it's, a, an, it's excellent, mostly because it's so light. It can be handheld without a lot of shake and it has really good image stabilization both in camera and in the software that does the processing. So this allows you to take handheld indoor exposures and they turn out pretty sharp. When you get into iPhone photography you quickly come to realize that it's not just the phone but what you have is a whole ecosystem of apps around that that allows you to do all sorts of things with that phone. Why do all these apps exist? The driver is this one, Instagram. Instagram is a, I don't know how many people here use Instagram. It's a huge photo sharing site. I'm not sure how many millions of users it has, but there, it has totally democratized photography where people want to share their pictures and they want to make them look good. So they're, they're willing to download apps to do things to make them look better. A, a, a large scale user of, and but there are lots of good photographers on Instagram. It's not just people posting selfies of themselves. I'm going to talk about some of these apps. Uh, you can see the camera app is the main app supplied with the phone. It doesn't have any manual control. So to get manual control I downloaded this app called Camera Plus. There's a number of other camera apps that give you that control. Plus the editing apps like Lightroom and Snapseed all can access the camera so you can take photographs from the app within the app and go straight into the editor. I started using Lightroom camera for a while but for reasons I don't understand, it doesn't focus as close as the built-in camera app or camera plus. And Lightroom is actually quite slow. I use it for syncing. Uh, if you have a, an Adobe subscription, you can sync 
between your Lightroom on the phone and Lightroom on your computer and it's great, you don't have to plug in your phone. Loch Voyle, where I took the picture of the canoe, if you go along Loch Voyle, it has this very ugly line of electricity poles going all the way across. And I thought this is a good example of an app called Retouch, which has got some easy to use facilities for actually retouching and improving your photo. So I started with this one and within about less than a minute, I ended up with this one. Retouch, of course, doesn't do anything you can't do in, in Photoshop, but what it does is it does it much more simply. These apps are not designed for people who are intending to spend a lot of time learning about a photo editor. These are intended for people who want to spend a very short time tidying up their pictures. So they've worked on making them very easy to use. So obviously what I've done here is I've got, I've got rid of the line of poles and I've filled in some of the road and it's all works, I think, a lot better than the original. Another example of retouch where a picture of me blossom but with a bit of a house in the background, removing the house took 10 seconds. Phones are used a lot for informal photographs of the family. You take them around the house, you take them when they're doing cute things, and you get this cluttered background. So what can you do on the phone to get rid of that background? Well, I used retouch. Retouch is good at getting rid of lines. So I got rid of the lines with retouch. And then I used this other app called Tada, which is very good at masking. It's masking ability is, in my opinion, a good deal better than Photoshop's. It makes it very easy to mask off part of the picture and then to apply an algorithmic blur to the remaining, to the remainder of the picture. So we've gone from this messy background to a much clearer, a much less intrusive background uh, with the baby sitting in the foreground. So the baby is, is, is much more center stage. And if you want a bit of fun, this is an app called Tiny Planets that applies some kind of strange circular transformation to things. If you want to try and produce abstract images, you can do that. You tend not to know what you're getting. This is one I think that works of some of the granite buildings in Queen's Road. Others are a complete disaster. I'm not a great fan of uh, blurred water and long exposure neutral density filters. Um, uh, to me, it looks unnatural. Uh, to me, it actually some, it often spoils an image by blurring everything out. But if you want to do it, there's an app for that. And you can, without the use of any filters at all, you can go from here to here. And with the ex exposure, number of seconds programmable, the degree of blur programmable, and so on and so forth. What's interesting is the way it does this, and I think there's no reason why other cameras can't do things that way. It actually takes a number of photographs and it integrates them. So instead of, instead of taking one photograph with the shutter open all the time, it takes several photographs at the appropriate exposure at maybe tenth, tenth of a second intervals, and then it puts them all together with the software to give you the blurred effect. The editors, some of the editors, go to have traditional film emulation. So this is a shot I took on the beach, which I then use an editor to get the Tri-X look. Tri-X film, something I've not used for many, many years. Uh, contrasty and quite grainy, and it's replicated that look here. If I want to have a softer look, Pan F, um, it's much less grainy, much softer, less contrasty. By choosing the right editor, you can choose the look that you want and you can get that replication auto automatically. There, they have color editors as well. The one thing that I haven't been able to find is a Kodachrome one. Kodachrome is apparently very difficult to emulate digitally. 
There's lots of black and white converters. This is a, again the local wood where I took the opening photograph of the mushrooms in the mist and some trees in Johnson Gardens. I use an app called Lenka which only takes black and white and which I really like because basically you're looking at the world in black and white, you see an image of the black and white on the screen, you know what you're taking. I've not done very much street photography but phone, photo phone cameras are great for street photography because people simply are completely used to people holding up the phone and doing stuff. I like this photo of the lady with the poodle and on the phone at the, the Inverse Necky Cafe on the, on the beach. <laughs> and of course people don't just hang around on street corners any longer, they always spend their time looking at their phone. So the, the theme of the last few sessions has been landscapes and landscapes are an example of a kind of photograph that I think is very good phone cameras are very good for. An autumn landscape looking over the fields in the late afternoon. Another autumn landscape on the Deeside Way which I quite liked with the, <coughs> the, the, the autumn leaves on the ground and the cyclist in the distance. I spent a wee while sit standing there waiting for a cyclist to come along. along. Luckily they had a red jacket on and a winter landscape down by the Dee with a mist coming off the river producing what I think is a very atmospheric shot. Another winter landscape by the Dee taking about four o'clock in late November, early December frost on the grass and a dolphin at Stonehaven. Seascapes on the beach I brought this, I included this because I actually brought a print of this if anybody wants to look at it. The definition you get with the phone is not just an artifact of a screen. When you print it, you can see just how sharp it is. Debris in the river. And sunset on the dawn. washed into the sea and the Brig of Balgarni. Not strictly a landscape I suppose but the winter light on frosted bracken I liked. And again I suppose not strictly a landscape but I like the, the cloud shadows on the, the university library. And finally Baby photographs, I really admire professional baby photographers. My daughter having had a baby recently, I've taken lots of photographs of them and extremely difficult to take baby photographs because of course they don't keep still. The phone is a fantastic tool for baby photographs because it has very fast autofocus, because it's light, it's not intimidating to, you're not putting a big camera in the baby's face and I think that it's far better using your phone, you're, you're more likely to get a good photograph than from using other kinds of camera. I think phone cameras are fantastic, they're fun to use, they're with you all the time. No, they're not as good as SLRs, but in many cases I think they're good enough and they get you photographs that you simply wouldn't take with your SLR. Obviously when you read articles about phones replacing conventional cameras, that's actually nonsense. Uh, anything with a telephoto, phones don't have a telephoto capability, so if you take sports, wildlife, anything like that, uh, a phone camera is of absolutely no value in that situation. But I think camera, conventional camera manufacturers have to watch out. Cameras have not really, the digital cameras have not changed much in the last few years. There's a huge spurt of innovation, huge improvement in those cameras in the first few years of their development. They reached a plateau in terms of quality and what they're doing now is adding bits and pieces to them but they're not really making a huge difference to the quality. There is no noticeable difference 
in quality between a, a three-year-old SLR and one you'll buy today. The innovations that you get in photography are coming from the phone manufacturers because their market wants the, the phone, the computer and the phone, to do stuff for them. They don't really want manual control. They want things to be made easier for them. So the innovation is coming in the automation. SLR manufacturers are in a different situation. Their target audience believes it can do better than the automation. And they don't want innovation in that respect. So their cameras have stagnated, their interaction, their user interface is frankly awful compared to a smartphone. Sales by all accounts are falling. Nick and Canon are both having financial difficulties uh, simply because if you've got a camera now, what's the point in buying a new one? And I don't know what's going to happen. Obviously, there's always going to be a market for SLR or mir and mirrorless cameras, but how these are going to change and how these are going to respond to the what phone cameras can do, I simply don't know. So that's it. Questions and comments.